Thank you. Compared to that film, this will be totally and utterly boring. Uh, I've been asked to talk about assessment tools, because one of the key things we need is to assess knowledge. As many of you know, I've been associated with a series of uh, assessments from the recent UK National Ecosystem Assessment, the International Agricultural Assessment, Ozone Climate, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment and the Biodiversity Assessment. So what have I learned from that? Well, the International Ozone Assessment is incredibly powerful. They were intergovernmental with expert uh, review. The IPCC, again, intergovernmental, expert government review, government approval of the summary for policy. Again, influential on national and international policy, albeit somewhat limited in the US. Uh, the International Agricultural Assessment, absolutely unique. It was intergovernmental, but with a multi-stakeholder bureau. It was a hybrid between intergovernmental and non-governmental, which, in my opinion, is the right way to do things. Bring all stakeholders into the management governance process. It's an incredible social experiment, hard to do, and probably will never be done again, because most governments don't want the other stakeholders involved in the assessment process at this level. But it underwent an expert government review. It's multi-scale, local to global. And I think the impact has actually been increasing. With the ecosystem assessments, the global biodiversity assessment was non-governmental, expert review, very limited impact on international policy or national. Why? We didn't have the appropriate mandate. It was a supply-driven process, not a demand-driven process. Never again will I be part of a, a, a supply-driven process. It's a huge amount of work uh, for very little pickup by the range of stakeholders. The Millennium Ecosystem was also non-governmental, but it was at least tied to the intergovernmental processes of the CBD, the CCD, and another half dozen conventions. Broad range of stakeholders on the board of directors, again, good, good peer review, it was multi-scale. The impact's been increasing, and it is now leading to something called the IPBS, which the next slide shows, the Intergovernmental Platform and Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And I'll chat about that for a couple of seconds. And lastly, the one that um, I was the co-chair of that we released about uh, four weeks ago, is a UK, so it's the only national one I've mentioned, it's the UK Ecosystem, so it was non-governmental, but a broad range of stakeholders on the board. It was expert government reviewed multi-scale at local to national, obviously within uh, the UK, and immediately had a basis on policy uh, because about uh, five days later we released the Natural Environment White Paper for England. So I've never have I seen the relationship between us an assessment and policy so quick. The Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, you could argue, is the equivalent of an IPCC, and I, that's why I'm hoping it will be, but it will be intergovernmental, but it will have four pillars of work. It will do assessments at the global, regional, sub-regional level. It will stimulate but not fund research, and we're thinking of a way of doing a special forum. It will do capacity building of both the scientific and policy communities, and it will be, develop policy-relevant tools so policy makers or decision makers makers in government, in the private sector, NGOs, uh, know how to use our information. The governance and management structures have not yet been worked out in detail, except we have agreed it will be intergovernmental. I've chaired or vice-chaired the three consultative meetings to date, and the next meeting, as it says here, will be in October in Nairobi. It has already been endorsed by the UN General Assembly. So, what are the feet? So, one of the questions is the pros and cons of different governance structures. Well, non-governmental, the GBA, uh, the MA, they're typically driven by the scientists bottom up. But there is a question about buy-in by those you want to use the information. Intergovernmental, for example, the IPCC, and that's proposed for the IPBS, driven a bit more by government, but still often then limited input by uh, by and by other stakeholders. And then there's the hybrid, the ag assessment, which I personally think is the right way to go. Uh, but as I say, it's a much more of a social experiment. It's one that not everyone in government's actually willing to buy into. So the IPBS will be more intergovernmental, much more like the IPCC, but the rules of the road, the governments have still got to be worked out. So what are the critical uh, features for success? Well, you need ownership and participation by all relevant stakeholders, all the way from scoping, all the way through preparation peer review. You need governments, private sector, civil society, the scientific community. It needs to be intellectually balanced, geographically balanced, if it's international. Uh, even in the UK one, we made sure we had participation of Wales, Scotland, Ireland, as well as England. Um, so you have to be sensitive to these things. Um, the experts must be there in their individual individual capacity. They must not represent a government, they must not represent their organisation. Absolutely critical that they are in their individual capacity. 
if it's an international global one, especially on biodiversity, we have to find a way of bringing traditional indigenous knowledge together with uh, sort of uh, other knowledge. We need local to global perspectives, and it obviously has to be conducted open, transparent process. Peer review is critical, must be policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive, must be evidence-based and ideological, you need to do both risk assessment, risk management, present different views, and identifying what we know with certainty from uncertainty and areas of controversy, absolutely crucial. Again, internationally and even nationally, multi-thematic, multi-spatial, multi-temporal, absolutely critical. Wanted to use just a couple of minutes on what did we find in the UK ecosystem assessment. About 500 experts from the UK were involved. We had an oversight group of pan experts, an oversight group of our clients, those that funded it, and a user group to make absolutely sure the users were actually involved in scoping it. Were we producing the information that was actually needed? So we look back 60 years, we look forward 60 years. We used six plausible scenarios for the UK. We did an economic assessment and we looked at response options. Only going to mention more the economic stuff. We came up with this framework for the economic. We looked at the full range of regulating, provisioning, cultural and main, uh, maintenance uh, services. But we recognise you mustn't double count. So while there were these primary and intermediate processes or services like soil formation, nutrients, you don't have to value them. All you have to value is the final ecosystem services, the services that give you the crops, the livestock, the ones that give you trees, the ones that detoxify pollutants, the ones that control the local climate. And so we recognise that when you value the food, fibre, energy, there's a lot of other capital inputs. Obviously, your bowl of cornflakes hasn't just got the ecosystem service. It's got all of the capital inputs of processing to get the cornflakes to transport it, etc. So we made sure that we would make sure we were not counting the capital inputs in the ecosystem services. We then looked at the value of the ecosystem services. Um, and then also, we looked at the plus, the non-monetized value. So we recognise it is both economic and non-economic value. We looked at this full range of resource-related goods, and you can read them for yourself. We use a whole series of techniques, value via adjusted market prices, obviously for things like food production, raw materials, flood prevention. We looked at value via the contribution to output, pollination, pest control, water quantity. We looked at value to avoid costs, i.e. for climate change. How if you had sequestration of carbon, how could you avoid climate change? We looked at observed behaviour on issues such as amenity values, such as recreation. So we looked at, and lastly, we had stated preferences, basically, which was not used as much as others. So we use a wide range. We use six plausible futures, uh, looking at the future world, and I won't have time to go into them, but you can read them in our document. So we went all the way from hugging nature, uh, that's a green and pleasant land, all the way to we don't care about nature, world market, unconstrained economic growth. We then looked at the full range of ecosystem services compared to today and say which services improved and which actually degraded in both our national security and world markets, more and more degraded, whereas in our other four uh, scenarios, actually most of them improved. We then actually, I'll show you two examples, Nature at Work, which effectively is where we looked right across the ensemble of services, didn't focus on any one, we tried to balance the services, and world markets, which was just economic growth. We then recognise that you have to do this in a very fine... So, so we did a one kilometre, one by one kilometre grid of the United uh, Kingdom, and we used expert judgement to say for all six scenarios, how would you use land and how would you manage the land at the one kilometre scale uh, throughout the United Kingdom? And that just shows you nature at work and world markets. Uh, we looked at agricultural output, we looked at the change in greenhouse gas emissions, that's net greenhouse gas emissions, uh, Inputs from agriculture, but sequestration from forests and soils. We looked at recreational value, we looked at urban green space, and we looked at biodiversity with a bird indicator, but we didn't put value on that. We felt that that was inappropriate. And so if you look at that, you can see that fundamentally, you can't have a single policy across the UK, because the, the way these scenarios play out and the way policies play out is highly spatially uh, dependent. So we looked at this. If you only looked at the agricultural market output, then quite clearly nature, uh, natural, 
NS um, and uh, world markets win big time because they focus on the market. If, however, you take all of the services that we evaluated into account, both the market and the non-market, suddenly those, uh, those storylines that were ranked number one and two became number five and six. And Nature at Work, which tried to look across the services, was by far that the best from an economic and, and actually social standpoint. And so a bottom line conclusion, which is totally the same as the TEAB report, totally the same as the Millennium Ecosystem, is the benefits we derive from the natural world are critically important to human well-being, but they're consistently undervalued. We now do have contemporary and participatory approach that allows us to look at both monetary and non-monetary. Shared social value is incredibly important, and I want to do more work on that. And if you don't take into, the, into our evaluation of non-market goods into decision-making, far less efficient use of resource allocation. And I'll leave you with this huge numbers of uncertainty that we need to understand. Most of them in the natural sciences, not in the economics. An understanding of the relationship between biodiversity and services. How does a habitat respond to the drivers? And you can read them for yourself. Thank you.